and uh, if you haven't used the cooperative extension, I am going to be a resource for you if you're interested in adding native plants to your garden because we are an extension of Rutgers University, bringing Rutgers University research and educational resources out to the community. So it is my job to answer your questions. So uh, please take advantage of that. I get all sorts of really interesting questions and then I learn more by having to do the research to answer the questions. So it's all lovely, it works. So today we're gonna talk about adding native plants to attract wildlife. And I'm a little stuck here, I don't know why. Oh, there we go. I just have a lag, that's all. So here's a brief outline I like to set expectations for what we're going to talk about because I'm not sure just how much the whole audience knows about what native means. We're going to quickly define that along with wildlife value and then we do have to talk a little bit about how plants are named so you'll be able to find these plants when you want to add them to your own garden and then we'll talk a little bit about some garden planning and some considerations and then we'll get to plants that are rated by how um, useful they are to the ecosystem for, for a variety of rankings. And then of course I have tons of resources. So I wanna first mention that I have added to the chat window a copy of this presentation, which includes all of the uh, links to websites, to Rutgers fact sheets and to recommended reading. So if you click on that PDF file, you can download it to your computer. If you prefer that I email it to you, um, my email address will be at the, is on that presentation, but also be at the end here. So you can just send me an email if you'd refer, you know, prefer to receive it that way. Because you're going to have to do a lot of your own research to make your choices on what you think is gonna work best for your garden. Some reason I have this lag I go to click and I'm there we are so first we're going to define native and um, a species that occurs naturally in a specific geographic area which is not really well defining things but when anyone talks to you about native plants they should be talking to you about the geographic region that they're discussing and today we're going to use a really broad sweep we're going to talk about plants that were living on this continent before European settlers arrived so we're, but plants can be specific to really um, highly unusual habitat regions and zones and the same is true for other living organisms but we're going to take a broader sweep and look at plants that are living on this continent, um, primarily things that are on our coast. Sorry, I've got this real lag every time I click for some reason. So in order to understand native plants and why they matter, I just wanna do a quick, quick little I'm hoping that this is an educated audience and you already know the answers to this, but that the relationships of insects and living things to plants that have evolved in the same space over millions of years is what makes native plants so important to our ecosystem because those plants have been around as food resources alongside insects as they evolved. And so the insects can digest those particular chemical compounds and that's why these relationships are so tight based on your continent and your, your insects and your flora and fauna on those specific continents. So different species of insects recognize different species of plants as food. Now plants don't want to be eaten by everything, so they use changing in their chemical compounds to compensate for it, sort of a chemical warfare. And then the insects have to adapt to that. So we have specialists and generalists, things that eat a lot of things are generalists and things that specialize are considered specialists. And this picture here is a monarch caterpillar, which is probably the best known insect specialist on a plant species. And that is a species of milkweed. Now it is the chemical compounds in the milkweed that make that caterpillar toxic to consume and those chemical compounds stay with that insect as it goes through its metamorphosis. So it's the plant that makes that insect unpalatable to other things. And this is a very specialized relationship. So those relationships and then are built upon by the things that eat those other insects and we end up with this complex food web that connects all of these things together. So this is why it's so important to understand that native plants are part of the space 
uh, where they live as part of their ecosystem and they are doing a service by providing food. They're, they're taking the sunlight and photosynthesizing and they're the first level in having food and the rest of us rely on that for food. Hmm. Sorry, hope you're enjoying my pictures. There we go. <laughs> it seems to take me three clicks to move from one screen to the next. Uh, so I don't like to talk about native plants without speaking about the flip side of that. And this is just a little vocabulary here, invasive species. So invasive is a, actually a scientific term that is a, a label that is given to species that have come into our our ecosystem that weren't native to our ecosystem and, and disrupt it for some reason. Now they can be plants, they can be insects, they can be animals, they can be diseases. So invasive is actually a scientific term, like a label that means that the plant has been studied, in this case we're talking about plants, but has been studied and known to invade and degrade natural spaces. So if you're talking about plants that um, you're finding in your audience, in your audience, right, in your garden, that are not behaving well with other plants. We would refer to those as a nuisance plant. Uh, the term invasive actually specifically means that the plant gets out of your garden into natural spaces and starts growing in those natural spaces to the detriment of the ecosystem. Now, plants get out into natural spaces through a lot of carriers. Wind will bring the seeds. Uh, birds are a, a fantastic carrier and, and other animals to move seeds around. So, a lot of times invasive uh, plants in particular not only produce a lot of seeds, but those seeds germinate at a very high rate. So even if you don't see the plant misbehaving on your property, it doesn't mean that the plant isn't getting out into the natural spaces. So that's just something to, um, to understand as, as vocabulary and to be aware of. In the United States, we don't have like a federal reg regulation on, on stopping use of or sales of these plants. So it's sort of a state by state circumstance and you can still purchase plants that are actually uh, doing damage to our ecosystem that are labeled as invasive species. So that's just something to be aware of. So there's one more thing we have to go over here and that is an understanding of botanical names. And I hope at this point people don't cringe, but we give plants a lot of names. We give them common names and then we give them botanical names. And if you understand the botanical name, you'll be able to pick the actual native species because a lot of our plants have relatives that uh, live in other continents. And so if you go simply by the common name, you might end up picking a plant that actually isn't native and isn't going to be providing food to our, our native insect species. So here I have an example for you. There's um, two plants in this, actually I, I named three plants for you, but there's two plants in this picture that I wanted to use as an example. First, let me tell you how, how um, plant names work. So plants have a genus and a species, and I like to use myself uh, as an example. So as a human, my genus would be Shirello. It's my last name. There are other people that are named Shirello. And my species would be Lisa. That's the specific one that I am from, from that group, Shirello. So in the case of plants, and always when you see these names on a, a name tag or in a magazine, they're going to be italicized and the genus is capitalized and the species is not. It's always lowercase. Then sometimes you'll see a little single quotation mark. That's what we call a cultivated variety. That's a plant that someone was growing and it had a beautiful attribute and they decided to clone it and make more of it. A hybrid on the other hand would be that a grower would take two species from the same genus and say, I like the flower of this one, but I like the disease resistance of that one and actually try to breed a new plant. The reason why this is important in terms of native plants and ecosystem services is that a hybrid could actually be a cross between a native plant and a plant that, plant that isn't native to our area. So it may or may not genetically have attributes uh, of the new resulting plant that are going to serve our native insect species. But we do know if we take the typical genus and species that are out there growing wildly, that those things are doing that for us. And we don't have a science on all of this yet. It's still a lot of it's new science, which makes it very, very interesting. So here's an example that I have for you. 
in the picture and these are our plants um, the pictures in here are pictures from my own little garden i'm only on a half an acre unless i otherwise noted it just um, for your information so the yellow flower in the back that is called prairie cone flower it's a very tall five foot tall because it grows in the prairie and it wants to get up above those prairie grasses so all the, the pollinators can find it and wave around and its botanical name is Retibita pinnata. So its genus is Retibita, see the, the capital, and its species, the specific Retibita, is pinnata. That's that species. But its common name is prairie coneflower. Now, the um, pink and purple flower in the front with that orange cone on it is probably more recognizable to most people. That's called purple coneflower. By their common name, they sound like they might be relatives, but if you look at their genus and species, they're not. That, that other plant is Echinacea purpurea, and it is not, does not share the same genus. So common names can be um, misleading. They, they were named based on how plants look, their attributes, and what they seemed to look like, but it doesn't necessarily mean that genetically they're related. And the genetics are what we're after here because for millions of years, that's how these insect species and plant species have developed their relationships. So does that make sense? You still with me on botanical names? <laughs> A couple head nods, that's good. <laughs> So when we talk about wildlife value, now we have a whole nother set of um, things that we have to be concerned about because a lot of times when we're looking for information on wildlife value, insects are not considered in, in those, um, those books and that information that you can find. There are a lot of books that say these are plants that are great for birds and why they're writing that is because of the seeds or the fruit uh, or the nuts that are produced by those plants but not necessarily the insects that are consuming them and birds eat an awful lot of insects so that is not frequently you're not going to find one resource that has all of these things together and um, in some of these resources you'll find that they're just targeting certain species like you can find uh, lists of uh, great plants for bees but then you'll find lists of great plants for honeybees versus our native bees so it's kind of hard to cross-reference all of this information and it's hard to find one reference that has all of these resources and sometimes we just don't even have the data yet we just haven't done the studies because we have a lot of money that will fund crop problems to figure out what insects are bothering our crops but not necessarily a lot of funding to go out and and find out what's eating an oak tree right um, because who's going to fund that research and sometimes our data just isn't there like in the USDA plant database um, in New Jersey a lot of times you you won't see something marked as a native plant but you'll see that it was marked as native to all of the surrounding states so that's probably just a case of the fact that New Jersey wasn't collecting that data not that the plants couldn't get across the Hudson or the Delaware River because surely they did right so sometimes the information is just lacking and that makes it a little hard and and confusing to be able to follow that so here's an example of wildlife value and this is a, um, a native raspberry it hosts 148 species of caterpillars of moths and butterflies that's our lepidoptera it attracts 149 species of birds, but then it's also a food source for rabbits and chipmunks and squirrels and raccoons, bear fox. It has a high wildlife value in terms of food resources for a lot of species. It's also a good nesting habitat if you're a bird because it's prickly and it gets all netted together and it's hard for prey to get in there. So it has other services besides food. And that's another thing to keep in mind if you're trying to add wildlife value plants to your garden. It's not just the fruits, it's not just the insects that can consume them that are food for other things, but what other purpose does that plant serve? Is it some type of habitat support for a species that you're interested in taking care of? Another consideration for wildlife is how does wildlife see your landscape? Um, and oftentimes I tell people that uh, some of these creatures, their, their family roots go back far, far, far more generations than mine do living where I live, right? Um, it, because as long as it's a good place for a bird to raise a family, it will continue to return there. And so too will its relatives from there on, as long as it's providing ecosystem services. So when humans get around, we travel on roads. 
When wildlife travels, they're looking for a safe corridor, a place where there's cover, where you can dart, where there's food, where there's water, where there's resources. Open areas um, tend to be, especially on where we are in, in, a, in a woodland area, tend to be areas of danger where you can get into trouble becoming prey for another um, organism if you try to travel a distance greater than 20 feet. And this is true even for birds. You will notice that birds will, will prefer to move from cover to cover rather than straight across open areas. Now, of course, there's going to be exceptions to that in certain habitat spaces like prairies and, and meadows where that's part of where the wildlife has adapted to live in those circumstances. But even there, there's a lot of cover in the high grasses. Most home landscapes are a lot of lawn, a few large mature shade trees, and then um, shrubs that have been told they may not grow taller than four feet in front of our windows <laughs> along our foundations. But we tend to be missing that between five and 20 foot height. And if you watch birds, um, that's where they're at. That's a good place for them to be. It's, it's high enough to survey what's going on. And a lot of the plants that grow at those heights are um, difficult for, for prey to hide in. They're not big enough to, to hold on to a large prey animal. So they're safe. They're a safe landing place if you're a bird. So adding things that are in that five to 20 foot height, large shrubs, uh, small understory trees that have good wildlife value is a, is a great way to start first assessing your own property and see if there's places that you can add on to those already existing edges of your lawn and, and make it closer to the wild areas to ex extend the ecosystem services for that already existing place. And then if you have a lot of overgrown shrubs, um, rather than, than removing it and replacing it with something that's gonna take a long time to grow back into that size, there are many shrubs that grow with many, multiple stems that take to rejuvenation pruning really, really well, such as rhododendrons, you can cut them back to, to barely nothing and they will return. So consider uh, a rejuvenation pruning of an existing shrub or moving a shrub that is too large for the space out to the edges of your property where it can expand in already wild space rather than uh, completely removing it and replacing it because mature shrubs really provide a great shelter food and nesting sites. When you choose plants, you have to be real careful to match the plant to the location. You need to understand your site conditions and understand where that plant has evolved over thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. It's not going to change its preferences. So you're going to need to figure out what your space is like and then find a plant uh, to match it. And you can because there are plants for absolutely every space. The plant in this picture, and this is not a picture that I took, uh, this is called button bush. This is a native New Jersey plant. We have a lot of wetland plants in New Jersey because we actually have a lot of wetlands. And this is a plant that likes a wet spot or a place that will frequently collect water. It is a large shrub. It is the absolute best plant for attracting butterflies. They will fight over it and it is a native uh, version versus butterfly bush, which is on our emerging invasive species list. So it is a fantastic, if you have a depression in a place that collects water, fantastic replacement for a butterfly bush. It is not a small plant. It's gonna take up a lot of space, uh, but it is a very high producer of happy butterflies, as you can see, a very strange flower, unusual flower. So the cultural requirements would be the hardiness zone that the plant can grow in, and that is the average coldest temperature in that zone. Most of Sussex County is a zone 6A, but up in um, northern areas, you might need to go up to a hardiness zone of five. There are some thin soils and some high altitudes that make it difficult, especially in exposed sites, for those plants to grow. Sunlight, think of sunlight as um, solar energy. The plants, as much sunlight as they get is as much energy as they have to produce all of their growth and their flowering and setting seed. So sunlight is a, is a determining factor that really has to be carefully thought through for 
proper plant location. Um, most plants prefer more sun rather than less and some plants are shade tolerant and, and that really is the way it should be thought of that they have they have over a years evolved to grow in an understory setting where they have filtered light um, and and they tend to have larger leaves because they need to take in more sunlight. They have a bigger solar panel in essence to, to bring in more light. Um, but most plants don't want to be in less than four hours of direct sun for some portion of the day. And, and for high flower production, you're going to need to get a lot more sunlight than that. If you think about tree canopies and you think about the the volume of flowers that are in a tree canopy because of the volume of sunlight that that tree can actually gather in. Uh, that's a good way of thinking of it. All of our soils are a mix of sand, silt, and clay and organic matter. Um, all of them have benefits and all of them have detriments. pH is a huge determining factor and one that when you're placing a tree you really cannot change. The, the pH of the bedrock from which your soil is made is always going to impact your your soil. So if you pick a plant that has a pH that's vastly different from the, the native pH of your soil, if it's a small plant, you can probably keep paying attention to it like an herbaceous plant or even some shrubs and, and keep pushing that pH in the direction that the plant prefers. But if it's a tree, that is not going to work long term. So make sure you pick your trees to match your existing soil pH because uh, pH is something that for the plant, because it evolved in specified locations, let's use blueberries for an example. Blueberries come from highly acidic soils, and I mean like a number around four, as low as four. Most soil for, for vegetables and most plants is at 6.5 for a pH. So that's a, a really big drop in, and Blueberries can't uptake the nutrients they need from the soil unless the pH is at that number. It's like having a straw, but it's crimped. You, you can't drink up the milkshake. And you really have to, it's a, it's a chemical thing. It's, it's because of the way that the plant grew and the, the location that the plant has evolved from. So it's not gonna change. It's something you're gonna have to change to your soil to adapt to the plant, which um, as I mentioned, you can probably do for plants with shallow roots, but is not gonna work long-term uh, to make a, a happy tree that you don't want to have to constantly uh, be manipulating to take care of. So much as I love American holly, I don't have soil that American holly can grow in here, so it's one I have to let go. So um, moisture is the other thing, and moisture is something to keep in mind. There are plants that love excess moisture, and there are plants that cannot handle wet feet even over the winter. This is actually something that's changing with our environment that, that is something to consider. A lot of plants, um, if it doesn't freeze over the winter, it might end up sitting in a wet spot and wet locations on roots that are not adapted to wet locations can be deadly over the winter. So too much moisture can be just as bad as not enough. So take a look at what your uh, topography can make a big difference too. You know, I'm on a slope. I have uh, channeled the water because, well, I followed where it was going and I planted wetland plants along the line of where the water runs. That way I can have plants that need extra water, but I'm not doing it, nature's doing it for me. So it can be, it can be actually an asset for you if you look at what, how it's working on your property, where the water is running. I would be remiss if I did any kind of talk about plants and didn't talk about deer in Sussex County. <laughs> um, they are here <laughs> and there are lots of them. And deer resistant means different things depending on where it came from. Um, some suppliers in different regions will, will note that a plant is deer resistant. That may very well be true in their town and may very well not be true uh, two towns over. Deer do have regional differences in what they decide to eat. So um, what's not on the menu in your neighborhood is a, is a good glance about for what plants are being left alone. That may or may not be true at your friend's house in a different town. So take a look, that's a, that's a good thing to look at. Deer have fantastic sense of smell and they know your yard better than your dog would so uh, they are they're in the area they're in the area every day they know what's new and what's changed so they're very hard to fool 
young deer will taste absolutely everything. They're usually the ones responsible for those those poor little annuals that for some reason look like they've been vaulted out of the ground in your lawn somewhere. Uh, and they don't have a long memory, so they'll do it again the next night, which is kind of funny. But uh, sometimes you'll need to protect things from their curiosity. So I suggest to people that all transplants need protection until they're established. So even if you find something on a deer resistant list that says that the deer generally leave it alone, that's true. Once the plant has been growing in the ground for three years, has established new roots outside its root mass and is got some foliage above the browse line and is a healthy plant and has everything that it needs so that now it can produce those chemical compounds that make it not tasty. But when it's first transplanted, all of its energy is going into growing new roots so that it can grow new stems, so that it can grow new leaves. And it is very vulnerable when it's first transplanted, which is why your neighbor's big glorious rhododendron never gets eaten and you buy one and stick it in the ground and the deer pluck off every leaf and you wonder what happened, right? So uh, there's a picture here of a river birch that I've put in a cage. Uh, I've put it in a cage for two reasons. Uh, one of them is um, I, I purchased these as bare root trees. They were very, very tiny. And because birch trees have that single trunk that is their form and their aesthetic, if the deer had eaten off the top, I would have had a club top tree for the rest of its existence, which would not have been attractive. So I was protecting it for its form, but also it's still in a cage for me, even though it's now 10 to 12 feet tall because it's exactly the right size caliper or width for a young deer to rub its antlers on, to leave its scent and to clean off its antlers. And that too would destroy the tree. That would destroy so much of the bark and maybe even some of the growing cambium layer that it could either break or damage the tree permanently. And so that's why my, my method, my preferred method here is to buy some, some wire caging and a stake because that wire cage can stay there. It doesn't collapse in high wind. It doesn't collapse in a uh, freeze. And I don't have to worry about it trapping birds or uh, insects. So it, it works better for me. That's what I've, I've come to use. I know it's not the most aesthetically pleasing thing in your front lawn, <laughs> but uh, there are more aesthetically pleasing ways to create uh, barriers. Um, there's a, lots of ideas and you can look up other ideas for me. This is what, what works quickest for me and I can leave it standing and then take it down after there's enough of the plant is big enough or it's above the browse line. So here's a wonderful equation that helps bring the point home about just how much of a resource insects are to other wildlife. This is a picture of Desiree Narango, who is a PhD student who worked with Professor Douglas Talame, who's an entomologist at the University of Delaware. Now, Douglas Talame wrote the book, Bringing Nature Home back in 2007, and really has been um, an ambassador for native plants and explaining native plants to people in a way that was much easier to understand. So his student Desiree did a study on how many caterpillars it took to raise a brood of chickadees. And these are Carolina chickadees, and these are their pictures. So between 350 and 570 caterpillars were fed to these little chicks on a daily basis, times 15 to 18 days, which is about how many days it takes to, to fledge. And that's fledge that's not, you know, now they're still, learning how to fly and the parents are chasing them around, but Desiree couldn't chase them around after they left the nest. So this study was while they were in the nest. So that's yielding on average 7,755 caterpillars per Carolina chickadee brood. That's per brood. Some birds have multiple broods in a season. That's a lot of caterpillars. I don't think until I actually saw these numbers, I really understood the volume of insects that are necessary to feed on the next trophic layer of organisms that, that rely on them. And just how much food trees are providing. When, when we think of browsers on trees, we tend to think of deer because we live in Sussex <laughs> County and they consume so much in one fell swoop. But really it's insects. 
Now, the study was done on caterpillars because they can't fly away and they you can catch them and they weigh something. But we don't really even know how many other species of, of beetles and beetle young, um, which is the largest group in, in insects are. So if we take caterpillars or lepidoptera ba babies as an indicator, um, this is amazing. This is an amazing amount of, of uh, insects that rely on our, our trees and our plants and, and trees in particular because of the volume of leaf surface area when you think about how many leaves the trees are actually providing. So if we move on utilizing that as a basis, then we can actually rank the value of those um, plants and then make our choices based on how much, is, how much available resources they're providing. Now, this, is where, this list actually came from a um, collaboration between the National Wildlife Federation and Doug Tallamy's numbers and research from insect species. So you can see that one of the things that he had learned actually was that 5% of our native plant species actually are providing about 75% of the high value of ecosystem food resources. That's a small number really when you think about all the different species of plants that are available. The good news about this is you can add very few plants to your home property and instantly increase the value of the ecosystem services that your home property is providing because it's only 5% of the plants. It's narrowing down the selections um, of, of what can actually help and benefit. So all of this information is on that, that PDF in the chat box, which you are completely welcome to download and, and, and I will email to you if you'd prefer me to email you a copy so that you have this information. So here's the same information for shrubs. I threw hollies in at the end because I'm particularly fond of hollies. Hollies um, have really, I don't know if most people have actually smelled a holly. You don't think of a holly as being very fragrant. They actually are very fragrant and they're highly, highly attractive to many species of uh, native bees and wasps. So they're just absolutely a buzz uh, with activity and then they provide fruit and they're, they're good nesting resources for birds. So um, blueberries require an awful lot of acidic soil specialized area. But they're actually a very pretty plant. They have fantastic uh, red fall foliage. If you have acidic soils, then you're, you're fortunate to be able to grow them. Um, I'd already showed you the, the brambles, the rubus species. We actually have uh, two species of hazelnut. We have beaked hazelnut, which are the smaller shrubs, and hazelnut trees that are native here. Bayberry is another great plant. When we talk about rows here, we mean like pasture rows or native rows, not, not our um, hybrid tea roses or um, other ornamental roses. Dogwoods, there are lots of different species of shrubs of dogwoods. Dogwoods feed a lot of insects. They also provide a lot of uh, fruit for birds. And of course, viburnum, lots of different viburnum species, same, same circumstance and uh, a lot of their flowers, those really tiny little flowers are utilized by a lot of tiny little species of bees and other specialized insects. And then here's the top, the top five for herbaceous plants. Goldenrod always gets a bad rap because it flowers the same time of year as ragweed. Uh, goldenrod is an insect pollinated plant, so it means the, the pollen is sticky. To stick onto the insect, it is not causing you hay fever. Ragweed is causing you the hay fever. Um, there are lots of different species of goldenrod. Goldenrod can grow in any condition, in dry locations, in hot sunny locations, in wet locations, in shady locations. There is a species for goldenrod that can grow anywhere. Wild strawberry makes a great ground cover and it provides fruit for a lot of um, other creatures. Sunflowers, what's not to like about sunflowers? This is the native sunflower here, but um, sunflower seeds are highly prized and utilized by lots of species of birds. Joe pieweed is a, a really large herbaceous plant and it has hollow stems, which make for great uh, habitat for our native bee species. They utilize them to provision nests. 
It also is very, very attractive to large uh, winged butterflies, Joe Pye weed. I have an affinity for really large plants. They start so small and they get so huge. I don't know. There's something about it I find fascinating. So it's on my list. <laughs> um, and our native violets. So if you're trying to think through what you would like to do um, for your own garden, then uh, here's my suggestions for how to narrow, narrow it down. Take a look at the objectives of the target groups or species that you might want to provide habitat for. Um, I'm particularly fond of the large winged butterflies. You can find a lot of butterfly lists, but most of our butterfly species are, are small butterflies. So you, if you're looking to provide resources for, for a specific species, then you can go to Butterflies and Moss of North America and actually drill down to that specific species. So if there are specific species that you're interested in, you know, certain types of butterflies, certain types of birds, use that as your objective for them to look for the plants that provide services to, to those creatures. Choose your garden aesthetic. Um, that's going to drive your choices of, of your plants. You know, if you like things formal and symmetrical and neat, you're, it's going to drive down your the choices for the plants that you want to put. Tall, lanky, Meadow plants don't necessarily fit in with that style, but they fit in great with, say, a cottage style garden, because that will also help you eliminate certain species that, that aren't going to work in, in your idea. And if you have personal preferences like uh, deer resistance or fragrant plants, that's another thing to add in there, because that will help you to whittle down the, the choices to the plants that are going to provide multiple services, not just to the ecosystem, but to your own garden aesthetic. Take a look at what's already on your property. You may actually have some plants that are providing a whole lot of good resources. You just weren't aware that they were there. When um, I'll use my garden in, in another slide as we come along as an example. And what lives naturally in the surrounding area, because sometimes there are some native species that would be great to allow to just volunteer in your garden, and they will if you know what they look like as younglings and they start to show up, then you can just allow them to continue to grow, which is a great way to add um, plants that are genetically from your area. Like you can't get any better than that genetically. So here's my example. It's kind of thick because I've been doing it for a number of years. So there's a lot of things going on here. Um, I'm particularly fond of what I would call the winged jewels. And that's anything that flies and utilizes the, the garden, uh, especially dragonflies, because they look like they're from the Jurassic period. <laughs> but um, birds, especially hummingbirds, dragonflies, butterflies, and moths, those two numbers there are the number of butterflies native to Sussex County. We have 118 butterflies and 501 moths. Some of the moth species are some of the most amazing and large, gorgeous of the Lepidoptera in our area, like the Luna moth, just absolutely gorgeous insect. Um, and I am also fond of amphibians. Amphibians kind of indicate that you have a, a really healthy ecosystem going on there. If you have toads and frogs, then you have a lot of interesting insects because you've got food for toads and frogs and salamanders. My garden aesthetic tends to be um, natural. I prefer asymmetrical planting so that when something inevitably doesn't, doesn't make it in a spot, there's not a hole. Um, I, and cottage garden is sort of, of what I'm after. I'm particularly fond of all these insects, so those are things you find in meadows, so I, I knew that was something I was going to um, incorporate into my garden. Most meadow plants are about three feet tall, so that's, that's not staying low and clean, so um, it's more of a cottage garden look. I personally like to leave my plants standing through the winter, um, and I I'm very particular about plants that crash on other plants. That's just not tolerated in my garden <laughs> because when they land on top of each other, they can create um, diseases and other problems. So I'm looking for four seasons of availability for food, and that includes, um, in particular, I love the goldfinches that pick all the seeds off of the really sturdy uh, meadow plants. And I even noticed that over the winter, the little downy woodpeckers will go up and down the stems of the 
bee balm looking for insects that have utilized the stems of those plants as an overwintering location. So that's also providing more food resources because you provided a place for an insect to tuck in and then the bird to find it. I already had a lot of um, plants that were on my property that uh, I identified. I uh, was very happy to find an oak. I'm particularly fond of Eastern Red Cedar. It's uh, a great it's what the cedar waxwing is named after, the little berries. It comes to eat the little berries, uh, and it's a wonderful um, nesting tree. I'm sort of lacking evergreen nesting habitat for birds in, in my yard, so I was particularly looking to add that. And um, in the surrounding area, there, there were some other um, trees and shrubs that provide some really great ecosystem services that I thought, you know, it, it, the other nice thing about knowing what's in the area is if you plant one, you know it will get cross-pollinated and it'll have high fruit production because it's already in the natural surrounding area. So in my, in my garden, because I had oak, I went for, for birch. I have um, heavy clay soil and a lot of runoff because I'm on a, um, a slope. And so good old river birch, like its name implies, likes being in wet spots. And so it was a good, it was a good one for me. Um, ironwood is a, an understory tree that's in the area. Uh, I admit I chose tamarack just because it's beautiful. <laughs> it's a native plant that grows in, in wet locations and I had a wet spot for it. It has um, a very thin, beautiful, tall, narrow form and it is an unusual plant in that it's a deciduous needled plant. That's unusual to see um, something that's a, a needled plant that's not an evergreen. And then this is a picture of sweet gum right here. Um, I, I bought myself two very little because I prefer to dig little holes and then watch them grow into nice big plants. Um, it's a columnar variety of sweet gum which does have fruits on it for the birds but I was really after it for its beautiful form, that columnar form and, and red fall foliage. So my choices were in part ecological and in part aesthetic. And then I found um, as I weed things that just show up. And so there are some that I was just happy to let them go. Uh, so my neighbor has an Eastern red bud, absolutely glorious understory tree that's uh, shade tolerant. It's in, in part glorious because it flowers on bare stems, which is just beautiful. You can see all the purplish pink flowers up the stems before leaves come in. Good old American dogwood corn is Florida um, and she self-sowed in my garden. So she's, she's there. And of course, uh, the Eastern red cedar pops up everywhere and so too does the black cherry and they are welcome so that they will replace um, their elders once, once the, the older trees uh, die out. Here are a couple of shrubs that um, I'm particularly fond of fragrant shrubs, bottlebrush buckeye and uh, summer sweet. The summer sweet is pictured here ha are deliciously scented and they have just started to bloom now. The summer sweet is in bloom now and the, the bottlebrush buckeye is just gonna start when the summer sweet finishes. Unusual time of year to have something flowering. That was a, another one of um, my desires was I wanted to find things that would flower later in the season. I found that I had a, a lot of spring flowering plants and a lot of summer flowering plants and then in the fall I seemed to have a gap which is where I wanted to make sure that I had um, more available resources for pollinators in the fall. So that was part of one of my objectives. Um, here's some other plants that I've added and then at the bottom are the, the nine barks, eastern nine bark because it's native to the, to nine, the first nine states. Um, very pretty uh, Foliar selections, it has exfoliating bark. It looks almost like cinnamon sticks, very upright plant. That was another one of my desires because I'm only on a half an acre. So I like my plants to go upright. So it gives me more space to plant something else next to it. And I'm a very fond of uh, hollies because they, they produce flowers as well as, as fruit. And um, the evergreen varieties have, have good uh, winter cover and nesting. So. I'm always looking for some evergreen add-ins. Blue globe spruce, um, the Colorado blue spruce, this is actually um, a cultivated variety that actually grows very slowly. Um, 
it, it is ultimately going to get too large, uh, like a very large shrub. Uh, Colorado blue spruce is native to Colorado. That's not always true in, in a common name, like Kentucky bluegrass is not native to Kentucky. It's not from this continent at all. But in the case of Colorado blue spruce, that is true. And uh, Colorado blue spruce uh, has troubles growing here in New Jersey because we have a disease that it does not deal with in its native habitat in Colorado. And it receives more rain over the the summertime in Colorado than we have here. So um, sometimes it, it struggles in um, areas. So it wants a little extra water over the summertime. If you go to plant a blue spruce, um, look up how it grows in its native habitat. And uh, that helps you to, to get the cultural requirements to match what the plant really is looking for. Uh, American elderberry is a very large uh, rangy shrub. It's uh, in fruit right now, and the fruit is so heavy that it bows down with the weight of the fruit, but you just can't beat it for the number of bird species that are happy to be clambering about inside there, um, eating all of those berries, some before they're even ripened. And uh, then it also makes great habitat for native bees because it has hollow stems that the native bees will use for um, provisioning a nest. This herbaceous list, because I have so many herbaceous plants and the lists go on and on, is um, I tried to stick with plants that were deer resistant that are growing in my, my front yard because I thought that would be most helpful. I um, absolutely adore hummingbirds and hummingbirds absolutely adore a Monarda didima Jacob Klein. That is the, the plant that is it, their bee balm. They will sell their souls for that plant. They fight over that plant. Um, I can never have too much of that plant, and thankfully that plant loves to cover territories. So if you have one, you have many, um, and if that makes you happy, that'll be great. Otherwise, some people might, might call that a nuisance plant, but I don't think you can have too much of it. One of the things that I've done with it is um, I put it in different places in my, in my property that have um, received sun at different times and warm up at different times so that it would bloom longer. That way I would have more available resources for the hummingbirds because it is absolutely their favorite. They will go to one little flower hanging off of that tuft. It's amazing. They're still trying to eke everything out of that particular plant. They also do like Monarda fistulosa, wild bergamot, the other species of that same genus there. Uh, but that plant uh, attracts a, a whole myriad of other insects and the large winged butterflies. So these are the plants that really do the best um, in, in my front yard without the deer causing them too much trouble. I have noticed that the purple coneflower, when, I, when it was young, the deer would eat it. And as it got older, for some reason, they seemed to leave it alone. The other interesting thing about plants is I swear they, they do have the ability to change their chemistry to deal with the stresses that they're under. And this is new science and it's, it's absolutely fascinating that, that species of plants will send out a, a warning so that um, they can build up their, their tannic acid and then they're harder to digest for when there's an oncoming onset of, of insect activity. And I have noticed in my garden that sometimes the monarda seems to be um, nibbled on by the deer and other times not in the least. And same with uh, the Joe Pye weed. The plant always recovers and will bloom in spite of it, might bloom a little later. But it's interesting that it seems to almost go in waves as if the plant is uh, been left alone one year so then it doesn't waste its energy on creating that chemical the next year and then it gets eaten because it tastes okay. And then the following year it's protecting itself again. So it's very interesting. Um, it's hard to find annual species uh, that that provide as as much attractants when you have herbaceous um, perennials growing in your garden. I noticed that most of the insects and uh, the activity is going to be on the perennial plants, probably because they just have larger systems and they can pump out more uh, nectar and more more resources. But um, maybe because we've done a lot of breeding in annuals so that they look good, so we can plant them in pots and, and we're not thinking so much about uh, maybe we've changed their genetics so they're not as recognizable to um, insects and birds. 
there's two exceptions there. That's uh, the salvias, um, and there's another one, salvia guaranitica, but that's a very large, very deep blue flowering plant, a uh, lot of foliage for a little bit of flower. But the um, salvia farinacea you see, and that's, that's a native plant. The bees absolutely love that plant. The hummingbirds will come to that plant, and salvia coccinea is the red flowering version. This is not the, um, the hybrid salvia that's, that's a lot of flower. This, this one is more foliage. It's the native seeds. They both start relatively easily from seed. And uh, they, they provide, um, I, I plant salvia coccinea so that when the monarda is done flowering, my hummingbirds aren't disappointed. They have something else to come to. Uh, so there's a succession um, just to keep them coming because I love to see them. So here's a whole bunch of resources, and th these are all on this PDF file, and I'll be happy to send it to you. Um, there's a whole bunch of different places that you can go to get some information. Um, the Jersey Yards location is a great place to, it, it, ha it links into databases. You can create your own garden design and, and look at all sorts of different um, interactive modules there. Uh, Audubon gives you a listing of um, plants to birds. So you look at the bird and then it will tell you what, what types of plants that would provide resources for that species of bird. Uh, Xerxes Society is fantastic for anything to do with insects. Butterflies and moths of North America, you can actually go in there to Sussex County and it will tell you all the different species of butterflies and moths that are, um, live in our region. iNaturalist, if you take a lot of pictures and you want to get and um, things identified is a great uh, resource to utilize because you can upload your pictures there and all sorts of naturalists. It's a naturalist community. They will identify whatever it is. It can be a mammal. It can be a plant. It can be an insect. And it's a really neat community of, of people that are just interested in wildlife and the environment. My favorite website here is the Lady Bird Johnson National Native Plant Database. This particular database, um, you can drill down in so many different ways, right down to Sussex County or to a broader area, but it's linked to the Xerxes Society. It's linked to Butterflies and Moths of North America. So when you click on the plant, it will tell you if that particular plant is of spe you know, special value to bees, if it's a host plant for certain species of uh, butterflies. It's uh, wonderful. And it has pictures of those native plants in their natural habitat. So what they look like in the wild, which I think is great because um, that's really what, what the plant's natural look is going to be uh, rather than if it's been pruned and it looks a lot more compact and then you get disappointed when you go and plant it in your own garden. The National Wildlife Federation Native Plant Finder has that um, butterflies and moths that are hosted crosslink and uh, then, of course, the Xerxes Society and the USDA plant database. Rutgers has a number of fact sheets and resources on uh, native plants. So we have incorporating native plants in your landscape. Um, really good research on by Rachel Winfrey, who does a lot of research for Rutgers on bees, native bees. And then the Rain Garden Manual of New Jersey, because this is a question that, that often people ask me, where do I go to buy native plants? The Rain Garden Manual of New Jersey, which is free, you just go, you could actually just log in and type that into your browser, has a regional native plant nursery list in it. And you can just click on that and it'll open it up and it'll show you native plants in New Jersey um, to go to as, as resources. There are online places where you can purchase native plants. Uh, for a lot of the herbaceous plants that I bought, I did buy them as smaller, like five inch plugs so that I could buy more of them and so that I wouldn't spend so much time with my hose because they had smaller roots. And so I could, I could water them quicker. But um, you can find native plants even in your box stars and your, your uh, Garden centers, the garden centers in Sussex County are particularly wonderful resources for native plants because um, we just, our people are interested in the environment here in, in, our, in our rural county. So they get asked to stock the plants and they do. You can find them there and they're very helpful. And then here's a list of books that are 
on my shelf, books that I go to um, time and time again for information. Um, Bringing Nature Home, here's Doug Talamay's book that has really been the thing that started it for me, that explained it for me, that made it easier to understand why native plants make a big difference in terms of providing services to the rest of the ecosystem. And um, the Gardening for Birds book here by George Adams, he, he put it together in a really interesting way. So he has plants and the birds that come to them, and then he has birds and the plants that you should plant for those birds. So it's like, uh, it, it was funny because it was like a language dictionary. You know, it was like Spanish, English, English, Spanish. I was like, oh, plant, bird, bird, plant. It's really unique. I hadn't seen anything put together that way, and it was very useful that way. Um, there's lots of books with lists of native plants. Um, I just have a couple of them here, Armitages and the Native Plants of the Northeast. Uh, the Native Trees, Shrubs, and Vines for Urban Rural Areas is a huge book, but it's wonderful because it gives you so much information. Um, it's the kind of thing you'd want to take out of the library or buy used. Uh, it gives you so much information about where those plants grow naturally, the types of soils that they need and, and that type of thing. And then, um, Heather Holm is from Xerxes Society, so if you're interested in pollinators and bees in particular, there's a lot of other resources here for bees. And lastly, I'm a resource to you. I am funded to answer your questions. So um, if, if I've overwhelmed you, apologize. And <laughs> if you have specific questions, and you want uh, help figuring out plants that might work in your space, I, I am here to do that. I answer homeowners questions like the Ag, Ag Agent is here to answer commercial horticulture questions. So uh, please utilize your extension as a resource and feel free to email me or to call me and I'll be happy to go through um, any types of uh, questions you have, even if it's, if it's disease questions about your plants, um, People oftentimes send me pictures of uh, insects and I, and I send on insects. I have to do an insect identification. This is why I'm learning so much about insects. 